Hello, health seekers. Welcome to another episode of the Keto Pro Podcast with myself, Richard Smith. Today, I am joined by a man that needs no introduction, but I will give him one anyway. Today, we're joined by Professor Tim Noakes. Tim Noakes has published more than 750 scientific books and articles. Uh, in 2012, Professor Noakes uh, founded the Noakes Foundation, a nonprofit uh, corporation founded for public benefit. Um, as well as the Norx Foundation, Professor Norx is the founder and director of Nutrition Network and co-founder of Eat Better South Africa. Professor Norx, welcome on board. Thank you, Rich. Lovely to be with you. Looking forward to this exciting next hour. Excellent. Nobody's more excited than myself, I can assure you. I can assure you. I've been looking forward to this one for quite some time. Um, so... First of all, thank you so much for coming on board. It um, As we just discussed before coming on, there's a few topics that I wanted to cover. Um, you know, I thought the best way to do this is perhaps to begin um, where it all began, if you like. Now, I, I don't think you mind me saying this, but you were probably um, the godfather of carb loading. Uh, in fact, you wrote the book, The Law of Running, which is the reason that every athlete... Uh, puts carbohydrate in before they do their marathon or compete in their Ironman event. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about that briefly? So my problem was that I started my medical training in 1969. And in 1967, a group of Scandinavians developed a new technique, which they introduced into the sports sciences. And that was called the muscle biopsy technique. And if you were a sports scientist in the 1970s and you weren't using their technique, you just weren't with it, you see. So with this technique, for the first time, one could measure the carbohydrate or glycogen stores in the muscles. And we were told by these experts that the only reason you ever got tired during exercise was because you ran out of this substrate muscle glycogen in your muscles. And not only that, without muscle glycogen, you couldn't do high intensity exercise. And because I was young and naive, and also because I was doing cardiological research, where the focus was on a high carbohydrate, low fat diet, because we were told that fat would kill you. So I bought into this theory as a youngster, because that's what I was told, all these eminent scientists who were training me, were telling me, you can't eat high, car high fat diets. It's going to kill you from heart disease. And the scientists in the four sports sciences were saying, you can't eat a high fat diet because you'll never perform any exercise. So that's how I grew up. And then so I wrote the first edition of Law Run 1985. And it's all about carbohydrates being the single most important determinant of performance. And that's where the physiologists got it all wrong because you can't reduce anything to one variable. So in other words, they said no, nothing else matters. Your mind doesn't matter. Your preparation doesn't matter. It's what you eat the day before or the two days before. But I bought in and wrote the book. And I wrote four editions. In 2002 was the last edition I wrote. And then my life, life changed in 2010 because I discovered the low-carbohydrate diet. And I converted because I read what was clearly the science that had never been taught, which astonished me. Here I am, a sports scientist, medical trained doctor, believes he knows something about nutrition, but had never really read that in depth the, low, the data on low carbohydrate diets, particularly for health. So I read this book, The New Atkins for the New You, written by friends, people who've become friends of mine since and i said but gosh this looks good and so within two hours i converted and with 24 hours i knew i was on the right track because wow. i immediately started feeling better and it turned out i was diabetic at the time i didn't realize it and then so i was able to put my diabetes into remission on this diet so then in about four months later i started writing about my transformation and that caused me all sorts of trouble I lost all my research funding immediately. Wow. So, so here we are researching carbohydrates to prove they're healthy. And all of a sudden, that money just disappeared. <laughs> and so, so I, fortunately, some funders continued because they, they recognized that what we were doing was important. 
and they weren't controlled by industry. So that was the issue that whoever's controlled by industry, they weren't funded. Anyway, so then I, we, I was asked to co-author a book called The Real Meal Revolution, which was really, a, a, it was a, a, a recipe book and uh, how, what you should be eating. And I was just asked to write a chapter, which I did, in which I focused on why there was no evidence that a high fat diet was bad for you in terms of health. And this caused a major furor because it became a bestseller in South Africa. And immediately the dietitians were asked, but hold on, you've been telling us we must eat a high carb diet and no says you must read, eat a high fat diet. And they couldn't adapt because they didn't, they didn't have the training to understand. They just, they learned stuff by rote. And I interviewed a couple of people on television. I was interviewed by some dietitians on television. And so I said, yes, but, but where's your evidence? They hadn't a clue. There was no base evidence base for what they were saying. So then eventually I tweeted something and that caused the furor. So the Health Professions Council decided they wanted to shut me up. Not just me, but every doctor in South Africa who had an opinion that disagreed with convention. That was the goal. And I, I recognized it early on. That was a, a challenge to freedom of speech, not just on diet or whatever. And so we went to court for four years, and I was in court for 28 days. And with our great friend from Wales, Zoe Harcom, Dr. Zoe Harcom, she was one of our expert witnesses. And we destroyed them. We absolutely destroyed them because they, they hadn't a clue. They had no evidence. These, these were the experts in South Africa drawn up the South African eating guidelines, and they hadn't a clue. And what's more, <laughs> what I said was exactly what they said for children for neonates. The dietary guidelines for neonates were exactly what I'd said. But because I hadn't mentioned cereals, that upset a lot of people, a lot of big industries in South Africa. And so they figured they'd have to shut me down. So anyway, what happened was, so here I'm a sports scientist. Now, all of a sudden, I get involved in nutrition. So I really go in depth and study it for, for 10 years or so. And I'm now at the stage where I finally finished that. I've I've solved, I understand why a high fat diet works in chronic disease. And then a few weeks ago, uh, my foundation published this textbook, The Ketogenic Therapeutic Carbohydrate Restriction in Human Health. Brilliant. And this is an astonishing work. It's not just me or a few of us, it's 62 authors from around the world. And we show that the low carbohydrate diet is the most studied diet in the world, the most studied diet in the world. And it's the most effective across a range of conditions, as you know, because you've experienced all of them. You've cured yourself of all these conditions by doing one thing, yeah. well, doing two things, the exercise and the diet. And so, so I went from being excluded by my university for promoting a diet which they said was dangerous and they said, you're claiming things which are unproven. I claim that this diet could reverse type 2 diabetes, which because the evidence has been in the literature, it, it, you can go back 40, 50 years, but even if you go back 10 years, 20 years, you'll find the evidence. But these people don't read the evidence. They're not interested in the science. They're not interested in the history. But uh, this book now lays it out. This is the best studied diet and the most effective diet for all these conditions. So that's that. So what I've so then while I'm doing this, I'm almost I'm wrapping up almost now. No, that's by, chance, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> by chance, a South African whose career I'd influenced in South Africa from the law of running, who got a tennis scholarship and went to work in America and became a professor in a in a college in the US and wanted to study something in exercise science. And I said, Well, what we have to do is look at the effects of high fat diets on exercise performance because it's not being properly studied in the right way. It's being studied by people who want to disprove it, not who, sorry, who want to prove that the high fat diet is bad for you. They don't want to test whether the high carbohydrate diet is good for you or disprove it, that, which science is about disproof. So I said, we're going in without any care. Whatever happens, happens. That's the result. And we'll start at the, the first study needs to be done would be a five kilometer time trial comparing athletes when they're on a high fat diet, high carbohydrate diet. And we knew, of course, that it's going to impair their performance. I mean, that we knew that. I'd been teaching that for 40 years. <laughs> so we knew. 
And of, unfortunately, there was no difference in performance in these in the five kilometer time trials. And these were reasonably good athletes. We figured they were better than 88% of, of all American athletes because they're recreational runners. So, so whatever we found for them applied to 88% of the runners in America. So we found that there was no benefit for carbohydrate, living on a high carbohydrate diet, if you just wanted to run five kilometers. So then Philip said, well, what do we do next? I said, well, we shorten the distance because that's we know that you can't burn fat when you're running fast. So if we shorten the distance enough, we'll find a, a, a distance that w at which their performance will be impaired. So I said, what we do is we do a, a 1.6 kilometers, a mile right, time trial. But then I said, what's going to happen is if we don't find a difference, the scientists will say, oh, well, it's because they all had so much muscle glycogen before the run that they could do a mile. But it's the second mile that you've got to worry about because then they'd collapse. So I said, okay, let's do 800 meter time trials. We do, sorry, interval sessions. So they'll do six times 800 meters because no one will argue that after the fifth or sixth, there would be muscle glycogen depleted. And if they started with low glycogen because they're on a high fat diet, by the fifth or the sixth, they'd have absolutely zero glycogen left. So there we really are testing the effects of muscle glycogen on performance. So we did that and guess what? No performance effect. <laughs> performance was identical in the one mile and in the eight times more importantly the eight times the six times 800 meters but what we did which which philip did and i hadn't thought about it he measured their metabolism during the mile which we'd expect them to but then during the trial during the repetitions he measured the he measured the metabolism as well and what happened was they were running at 86 percent of vo2 max and the textbook, which you can go and look at, it will tell you that at 85% VO2 max, you burn zero fat. Zero fat because you have to burn glycogen. So what happened? We found the highest rates of fat oxidation ever reported in humans. And that goes right across the board, the history of exercise physiology. No one has ever measured higher rates of fat oxidation. So here we have people running at 86% of max, and when they're meant to be burning zero fat, they're burning two grams a minute of fat. Now, let me tell you what two grams a minute means. When Elliot Kipchoge breaks the world record, breaks two hours in the marathon, he would be using about 80 kilojoules of energy per minute. 80 kilojoules. Now, it turns out that two grams of fat would provide 76 kilojoules of energy. So he's got a tiny little deficit of four kilojoules a minute over two hours, which is zero. So he could run the whole marathon at two hour marathon pace, just burning fat. Yeah, zero. Carbs. I'm not suggesting that's ever been proven, but that's what the biology tells us. Yeah. And so, and you know, I came into this whole story about if you read Law of Running, it's not all wrong. A lot of what's written there is right, but it's just the, the context is wrong and the emphasis is wrong. But I worked out why you couldn't do an Ironman. And I know you're training for the triathlon now, but why you couldn't do an Ironman because you'd run out of glycogen before you started in the marathon. And then we have people like Mark Allen who ran a 239 marathon after six hours of other activities. It's impossible. If you're just burning glycogen, you can't do it. And so we calculated he had to have a high rate of fat oxidation. And clearly they do have it, although no one bothers to, to really go and measure it. Because that's the only way you can do the Ironman in eight hours or under is if you're burning a lot of fat. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the story. So I then started working more and more. And in the last year and a half, there's a chapter in here about nutrition and exercise where I start talking about the evidence that carbohydrates work is true, but I want to find out why. Why do carbohydrates allow athletes to perform better? And the clear evidence was known in 1939, and it was written out of history, completely written out of history. And, and in fact, I in fact have the papers right here just by chance, so I'm going to get them.
So, so what's really interesting, and this is the, what I'm working on now, is that the advancement of science requires equipment and new techniques to measure things. So August Krog, who won the Nobel Prize for other work, he in the 1920, this was 1913, he produces the two greatest pieces of equipment that we use in exercise science up to today, and that is a bicycle ergometer. So here we have a bicycle ergometer and respiratory apparatus for the experimental study of, modular, of muscular work. So this is 1913. He, in his laboratory, that was in, in Denmark, actually, at the time. So he develops the system which can measure your oxygen consumption and your carbon dioxide production with massive accuracy. So he publishes this paper in 1919. And then his laboratory starts studying he and Johannes Lintart write this, and they study the relative value of fat and carbohydrate as a source of muscular energy. This is 1920. Wow. Now, it's interesting, in 1920, th their interest is to work out how much energy can you get from burning a molecule of fat versus a molecule of carbohydrate. That's their goal. But how do they get humans to just burn fat or just burn carbohydrate? So they they put them on a high fat diet or a high carbohydrate diet. Now the high carbohydrate diet is quite foreign to the Swedes at the time. I haven't completely worked this out, but the Vikings didn't eat carbohydrates, but carbohydrates did come into the Swedish uh, diet before 1920. But I don't believe it was a major part of the Swedish diet. So they were studying something that was un unusual the high fat diet was what was usual. The high carbohydrate diet was not the diet. And by chance, they found that the people on the high carb diet didn't do so well. Sorry, the high fat diet didn't do so well. They couldn't exercise for as long. So this is where the idea gets starts to become that actually you can't exercise on a high fat diet. But remember, this was uh, the short term experiments. They didn't adapt for any length of time. So, so those are the first studies. And then along comes a guy called Boye. Let me find if I can find him. Uh, I have, for some reason, I haven't got it here. But anyway, and I can't trace what he was, whether he was a lecturer in the department or he was just a student. And he goes out and puts himself on the bicycle that we've already seen, and he measures his oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production, but he also measures his blood glucose levels. And he just gets on the bike and pedals for as long as he can, and he notices his blood glucose starts dropping, and when it drops so far he can't continue, he takes some glucose and he's back on the bicycle, and an hour later he's still pedaling. So he showed, and then these two guys came along, the guys who were head of the laboratory, Christensen and Hansen, who were two of the very most famous uh, scientists of the era. And they're the ones who started uh, the exercise sciences in Scandinavia, which gave us so much, including the muscle biopsy technique. So they get Boye to do the same experiments but he's relegated. He's not a co-author. Now he just becomes running. He's just doing the experiments. And this is in German. It's a publishing occasion in German. And all the scientists, English-speaking scientists like myself, oh, yes, no, we know that they found that carbohydrates worked. But they didn't read what they said, how it worked. So a few months ago, I got this translated, this article translated by my colleagues, very very friendly colleagues who I studied medicine with, and both are German speakers, and they translated it. And I discovered that these guys had concluded that the reason why the carbohydrates worked because they reversed your falling blood glucose level. And that's how it worked. So they said, You've got to protect yourself from a falling blood glucose level. So what the brain says, it says, okay, we're stopping your exercise. Because we're not going to kill the brain by continuing to exercise and use up the glucose in the bloodstream. 
we're going to stop you. And that, but give us some more carbohydrates, and we'll the blood glucose level will rise, and we're fine. So at the end of 1939, so the start of the Second World War, that was what we knew about carbohydrates, that they work by reversing a low, falling blood glucose level. But when the muscle biopsy technique came along, it changed. People said, no, it's not blood glucose. That's the 1920s. We don't, 1930s, that technology is way out. We've got this lovely muscle biopsy technique. We're measuring, measuring glycogen and fat in the muscle. And we know that's the cause, you see. So that's what I said for 30 years until about a year, about two years ago, I, I looked at the slides from their iconic studies. The one famous study that every exercise physiologist will quote. And by chance, I have it here. Uh, let me find it. This is it. Now, this is the iconic study that set us all on the wrong path. It comes from Stockholm, which Christensen had gone from Denmark, from Copenhagen to Sweden. He'd started this laboratory and this laboratory did the muscle biopsy. But he's unfortunately now retired and he, no one remembers his studies because they're old. We want new stuff. So this is the, this is the study, diet, muscle glycogen and physical performance. And if you read Law of Running, you'll see that this takes pride of place in the book as the iconic study, showing that muscle glycogen depletion causes fatigue. And I'll just see if I can maybe find the one figure that we all quote. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, of course, we reproduce it slightly better. But what this slide shows is that as you go from here left to right as you go from let me find my finger and sorry i'm doing it in reverse <laughs> <laughs> but if you go if you go from maybe you can see this maybe that from there to there that means you've got more muscle glycogen and this is how long you could exercise for so basically the more glycogen you've got the longer you can exercise for so this is the iconic figure which we reproduce in our own diagrams. This proves that muscle glycogen determines exercise performance. Now, what I, what I suddenly realized about a year and a half ago was there's another graph that we didn't bother to talk about. And it's this figure here. And this figure at the bottom shows what happens to blood glucose levels. And that's, uh, I, I don't know if you can see this, but the bottom figure, you'll see at the start, the values are reasonably high. And then as they go along, the first one drops very quickly. Then there's another blood glucose falls qu quite quickly. And then the third one, it stays a bit better. Now, these, the two that drop very quickly are the people eating the low carbohydrate diets. Whereas if you eat a high carbohydrate diet, you can regulate your blood glucose slightly better. And so you can last a bit longer. And this is forgotten. Now, how can you forget this? Because Christensen and Hansen had said blood glucose is a key driver of fatigue. But Haltman and Bergstrom, who wrote this paper, just ignored it, completely, utterly ignored it. And so did I, and so did all the other scientists. So what I've been working on for the last year is to look at the evidence that it's hypoglycemia which is causing the problem. And the evidence is remarkably clear that what stops you in exercise initially so there, there are stages of fatigue but the first stage is if you don't take carbohydrate during exercise and it doesn't matter how much carbohydrate you've taken before exercise if i get you on a bicycle just like boye when he got the bicycle eventually his blood glucose would fall if you didn't take glucose and that's exactly what happens so the first experiments that that were done that showed carbohydrates work were done in people who didn't take carbohydrates during exercise in the control group and their blood glucose dropped and they get tired and they stop. But if you give them carbohydrates, they can continue, which tells you it can't be muscle glycogen because that glucose is not being burned in the muscles as these people showed in already in 1930. 
But unfortunately, the sports drink industry came along and I had a long battle with them over, over promotion of drinking. Um, this book, Waterlogged, this is where they over-promoted drinking and that caused a lot of problems. So what they've been doing is over-promoting carbohydrates. And so the point is the following. If muscle, if sorry, blood glucose causes fatigue, you really need just a touch of glucose to prevent that. Literally five to 10 grams an hour is enough to keep you going for most people. Maybe some will need 20, but it's between five and 20 grams, I would guess. And we're studying it at this very time, but that's the minimum. Now what happened, industry doesn't like that. No, 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 five. We'll never be able to sell any product. If you only can take five grams, you can make it yourself. So they have pushed the scientists to say it's 90 to 120 grams per hour you need during exercise. And they've done that by saying that the carbohydrate is working in the muscles. They're providing a fuel in the muscles, not for the brain. And they're wrong. And that's what I've spent the last year and a half showing. And I've shown, and so the, the, I'm going to wrap up now, definitely. What, the truth is the following. This is the bombshell. The bombshell is that your muscles prefer to burn fat under any exercise conditions. And the only reason you burn carbohydrates, listen carefully, everyone, the only reason you burn carbohydrates is to get it out of the system, to get it out of the body. Because every time you take carbohydrate, you spike your glucose. And the whole metabolism is built around keeping your glucose flat. That's what humans evolved to keep their blood glucose as flat as possible. And what we've done is we've gone from that mainly carnivorous diet, which will keep your glucose pretty flat, to a diet which is high in carbohydrate, which causes these glucose spikes. And the body says, no, no, absolutely not. I must get rid of that carbohydrate. And so that's the first thing. So you burn the carbohydrate. First, you will burn carbohydrate. Doesn't matter what you do, you will burn that carbohydrate. And I'll show that other, it has other effects. So you burn the carbohydrate to get rid of it. And then the body is so clever because it says, I know you're going to have more carbohydrates. So we've got to get rid of all the carbohydrate that we possibly can. And muscle glycogen, you can't slow muscle glycogen use down. You can't. It's impossible. We've been studying it for 30 years. The muscle glycogen use just goes on and on and on. And the more you start with, the more you burn. And you can do what you like. It doesn't affect it. Well, how would that be? <laughs> when you can burn fat instead of it. And I think the answer is that the muscle glycogen is purely a dumping ground. The body tries to get rid of the glucose out of the bloodstream, and the best way it can do that is just dump it in the muscles. And so we as scientists came along and said, that's good. We're dumping glucose in the muscles, and that then makes you a better athlete. It's not true. You dump it in the muscles to save your life so you don't become diabetic. Now, unfortunately for me, I dumped too much glucose into my muscles and developed type 2 diabetes. So the high, high carbohydrate diet, I now fully understand why it's causing diabetes because carbohydrates are the problem and the body's designed to get rid of them. And so it's got the system which works well for 20 or 10 or 15 or 20 years and then it gets fatigued. And that's when you move into pre-diabetes and diabetes. And to me, that's the simplest explanation for why we've got this diabetic diabetes epidemic. Of course, exercise is important, but the most important thing is how frequently do you spike your glucose over genera over decades? Yeah. And some people can do it, but most of us can't. Yeah, I agree. That's incredible. It I've never heard it explained that way before. Uh, and as you 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 uh, rightly stated before we came on that you were going to drop uh, a bombshell. Um, so basically, I mean this this is driven by the brain's demand to stay alive. Uh, and excreting yeah. something that the body regards as a toxin. So carbohydrates break down to glucose, and glucose is a toxin to the body. Um, so, yeah, that's incredible. It, it's coming back to what you were saying there about 86% of VO2 max. So I've been working recently with 
a cyclist, an amateur cyclist who is borderline professional. So he's been racing in France for some professional teams. Um, he uh, has gravitated into a low carb, then ketogenic lifestyle. And now he is carnivore. So his metabolic state is ketosis. And he recently rode for nearly four hours, uh, pushing out something like 368 watts per kilo, mm-hmm. but 360 watt average uh, at 92% of VO2 max, mm-hmm. which is according to all literature, it, it is biologically impossible. It was his best performance to date. Um, mm-hmm. And he did that on zero carbohydrate and zero food intake whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I'm not surprised some of the athletes that I work with um, have competed in Ironman. Um, mm-hmm. And some of which decided to do Ironman last year completely uh, in a fasted state. So other than water and electrolytes during uh, the bike ride, they consumed zero nutrition for, for the entire event, which is absolutely incredible. And they beat their previous PBs by somewhat. Um, yeah. But it's it almost feels like it falls on deaf years when it comes to a lot of the other athletes because they're still in this society that tells us that we need to carb load. And I'm hoping that they will listen to this now. And you you have broken that down so eloquently that I'm hoping that that will will sink in there. But, you know, one of the studies that they keep referencing comes back to somebody you know incredibly well, um, Louise Burke. Um, Now, Louise Burke is a sports nutritionist in Australia. Um, She works with elite, elite athletes. And I believe... Last time I checked, her uh, establishment was sponsored by Gatorade. Gatorade. Are we, we yeah. can a lot of stories about that, but um, you can go to the British Medical Journal, the British Medical Journal, to see her connections. And in fact, the connections of all the Gatorade-funded scientists. But let's just quickly make a point. Louise and I are currently involved in a debate, which is going to be published in Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise which is a funded by the American College of Sports Medicine, which is funded by Gatorade. And so for some reason, one of the editors who he admitted to me that I'd influenced his career, he said in 1981, I came to Cape Town and he was so kind to me because I was a beginning scientist. So now he's quite a well-known global scientist. And for some reason, he asked me to debate Louise on the carbohydrates versus fat diets which I must tell you, someone else had invited me to do that. And I wrote something that they said, I can't publish. This is too personal. (laughs) Because Louise had said some nasty things about me at various meetings, and I was still feeling a bit raw. So anyway, they never published that. So I'd been prepared. So now with this one, I was completely scientific. There was no personal stuff at all. And I just uh, wrote stuff and The point about Louise Burke studies, and people don't understand it, and this I made the point, is that they're not randomized controlled trials. That's the key. If you don't randomize it, you don't know that there's something that you miss that influenced the outcomes. So what she did, and I understand why she did it, because it's difficult. She was working with athletes who are in training. And let me tell you, those are three fantastic studies because they show how quickly elite athletes can adapt to a high-fat diet. I mean, I couldn't believe it. In the end, five days, they'd reversed their fat oxidation, and they were burning fat at 1.5 grams per minute, which is huge. But in five days, so it's got nothing to do with training. It's what diet you're eating determines how much fat you burn. And it's so funny on Twitter that these people, I follow a couple of people, and one of them, well, you know, if you get out, how do I increase my fat burning? Well, you got to do this and that and the other. Actually, no, no, no. All you have to do is change your diet and then the fat burning is is right there. But they can't accept that because I'm the coach and I'm going to tell you that it's I'm a coach. It's physical. It's not diet. So anyway, the point about a randomized control trial, she, when the athletes came to her, they had a discussion and she tells them which diets they think, she tells them, what she thinks about the different diets. So that immediately introduces bias because 
if she's being truthful to herself, she has to tell them that I don't like the high fat diet. Otherwise, that's what she's been teaching for 20 years. So then they self choose between a high carbohydrate and a high fat diet. Now, why would someone choose a high carbohydrate diet or a high fat diet? Or why would someone in training for Olympic competition choose a high fat diet? Doesn't make sense. You know, you wouldn't do that unless you had some reason to do it. So her problem was she should have randomized them to the to the diets without them choosing what they that's the first thing. And second, it's very difficult in a dietary study because people obviously know what they're eating, and that also produces bias because if I believe a high fat diet is no good for me and I eat a high fat diet, and Louise Burks told me the high fat diet doesn't work. And I get to the point in a time trial where I'm feeling tired. No, but Louise said this diet doesn't work. So obviously it's not going to work. And that's why I'm feeling so bad. So I take the effort off. So, so that's the problem. You, without randomization, you can only pre prevent, develop an hypothesis. So Louise's excellent work developed the hypothesis that the high fat diet impairs performance. She did not prove it. The editors and the reviewers of her papers should have said that because in that paper title, it's always the high fat diet causes X, Y, and Z, which is bad. But she didn't prove it. So she can't say that in the title. She has to say hypothetical evidence that a high fat diet may X, Y, and Z. Then it's fine. But it's not science to say you proved something when you didn't do a randomized controlled trial. Now, unfortunately, this story, you know, these were we're working with Olympic athletes. I mean, this is going to be the answer. And industry helped because that made sure that the running publications and that Ironman triathlon publication made sure that her papers were well publicized without the proviso that this is not proof. So in my debate with her, I said, but but I said, here are all the studies showing that a low carbohydrate diet, diet does not affect performance. From 100 meters up to whatever distance, I forget what the long 100 kilometers time trial. So there's all the studies. Now you're rejecting them on the basis of non-randomized controlled trial in a small group of elite athletes. And the only reason you're using it is because everyone gets confused because they're elite athletes, so they must produce the answers. So I said that. Then I said there are five randomized controlled trials including the two we've done at one mile and at uh, five Ks. But there are three others, which are very key. And one of them goes up to 100 kilometers. No difference in performance with whichever diet you use, but they're randomized controlled. So therefore, the hypothesis is disproven. The hypothesis that a high-fat diet impairs performance has been disproven by five randomized controlled trials. So you can't make that argument. And yeah. then the final point was the one I made to you already. Louise said, but you don't understand the requirements of high intensity exercise because you didn't blah, blah, blah. You only studied athletes who are recreational running one five kilometers or something. So I said, but then I brought up Point Hollett, but we measured this high rate of fat oxidation, which will be enough for Elliot Kipchoge to run the marathon in under two hours. Argument over. So anyway, that will be published quite soon. And it'd be interesting to see see what happens, how it's accepted. Because it, it's really interesting, you see, because I was involved in the first study that proved, <laughs> sorry, that showed an effect of a low carbohydrate diet, Lambert et al, 1994. And we continued in this, and then we had a study which seemed to show the high fat diet didn't work. So Louise, didn't choose the first study and say, gosh, look, it works. She chose the second study. See, it doesn't work. And she wrote two editorials saying this is the final nail in the coffin of the low carbohydrate. Oh, sorry, the low fat diet. Is what, sorry, the low carbohydrate diet. The nail in the coffin. But it was one study. How can one study change everything? And so that's that was the problem. And from that moment, from the moment we published that study, suggesting that the low carbohydrate diet didn't work under certain circumstances, but there were specific circumstances. Then that became the story. Well, low fat, low carbohydrate diets don't work. And 
there's now a body of evidence showing that there's no difference. So my conclusion is that your pre-race diet has no impact on your performance. It can be high fat, can be high carbohydrate. And the only proviso is if it's going to be a long exercise, you must take carbohydrate during the exercise because or else you're going to become hypoglycemic. Will the body create enough glycogen? Well, you don't need it, but in the liver, that's your question. Yes. Will the, will the body produce enough liver glycogen? So I and know answer, that. And the answer is no, it, it won't. And I believe that if I was to take any athlete, I could get them to the point where they would become hypoglycemic. However, if you're fat adapted, that's going to take longer. And 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 all I need for you is to tell me that you've seen athletes do an eight hour or nine hour Ironman without becoming hypoglycemic. And then I'd say, well, you see, there you are. They've managed to adapt their liver metabolism and their brain metabolism so that even if they become slightly hypoglycemic, they've got ketone bodies that they can burn and they don't notice it. Yeah, so so in the, the experiments in the 1960s, the long-term starvation, they got the blood glucoses down to 1.2 and people didn't even recognize they were hypoglycemic because they were burning ketones. So if you were a really an athlete who was absolutely rigid and never ate carbohydrates, you probably could adapt that. And I've got a friend here in Cape Town who cycles literally 120 Ks a day and eats no carbs and never runs into trouble. Sean Sakonofsky. Is it Sean? That's the one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Sean, yeah, you'll know all Sean. Yeah. Yes, I've done a podcast with Sean. I get on incredibly well with Sean. Um yeah, it's um, it's 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 definitely a science, isn't it? It, uh, I mean, if one of the athletes that I work with has done an Ironman in around nine hours on no carb, um, but he has been uh, heavily keto adapted for quite for quite some time. Um, I think he's given his time, uh, his body a chance to upregulate the monocarboxylate transporters and all the enzymes involved with with upregulation of of, of utilization of ketone bodies. But but what you're saying is it, if high intensity for um, a long period of time, um, we would get away with five to 10 grams of carbohydrate. That would be sufficient every hour to, to see us through. So if, for example, in, in regards to my training, if, if I were to compete in, uh, my next competition is a duathlon. Um, mm. So it, it's a short one. Um, it's uh, again, I've only recently been competing this year in running and cycling, but I'm hoping to do a duathlon. It's um, a 5K run, 22K bike, followed by a 2.5K run. So it's a sprint duathlon. Um, would I require any carbohydrate whatsoever to do that at high intensity, or is that too short, or is it a case? Absolutely no need. Absolutely no need. Yeah. You, okay. You'll have enough liver glycogen. The key, sorry, the, the point is that you need liver glycogen, but more importantly, you need a liver that's going to produce glucose at a particular rate, at the same rate that you're using it in the muscles or in the brain. I'm Sorry, I should say that. I think that the glucose in a fat-adapted athlete, the glucose the liver's producing has been used by the brain. And so it depends how much the brain needs, how much glucose that person's brain requires will yeah. determine so, so you've got to you've got to adapt the, the liver to produce glucose at a rate that will keep the blood glucose normal and you know that's another thing i discovered which no one has ever discussed that when you exercise doesn't matter whether you're carb adapted or fat adapted your carbohydrate oxidation goes down because you're using up muscle glycogen and so the further you go the the total carbohydrate you use goes down but extraction of glucose out of the bloodstream goes up which is paradoxical. So everyone thinks that you're saving, you're not burning, you're burning less and less glucose or carbohydrate, which is true, but you're burning more and more blood glucose. And that's the problem. So you've got to re refuel by pro providing more glucose, which you can do by ingesting, or else you must have a liver that can keep up the delivery of glucose to the bloodstream. And, and we did a study looking at blood glu uh, liver glucose production during exercise in, in fat-adapted athletes, and it's just fine. They keep their glucose normal. 
but we only went three hours so we don't know what happens thereafter i must just you know you've given some beautiful examples but i'm proud of a couple of things one thing is dave scott who was one of the most famous ironman triathletes of all time and in fact the, he starts the ironman it was his performances so he 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 sent me an email he said tim i've read your book the real meal revolution i changed my diet now this is in his 60s and he said the health benefits are huge he said i will never ever tell the tri any of the athletes i train to eat high carbohydrate diets because they just burn out he said now this is a guy who's trained athletes for the last 30 years so he's had enormous experience and the other one is not a Welshman, but a, a Rhodesian, David Pocock, who became very famous as captain of the, the Wallabies rugby team. And uh, we've had a lovely story because in the World Cup 2011, the referee was so appalling in the quarterfinals that Australia beat South Africa by one point or something, but it was completely, looked like the game was fixed. I mean, it was too terrible. And the referee was awful. And the referee allowed David Pocock to do what he liked. He was the guy, the fetcher. So he was fetching the ball and breaking the rules all the time. So, of course, he, he was playing on the side of the rules, but the guy wasn't playing him up, so he did it. Anyway, he he informed me that he'd also read my book and he'd changed his diet. And he said, my performances went up. Now, this is a, a guy who's involved in high-intensity exercise. And he said, I put on an extra kilogram. And he's one of the most muscular athletes you'll ever see. He brought on a kilogram of muscle and lost two kilograms of fat on the high fat diet. So these are two of the world's best who, who followed the diet and discovered it worked for them, despite what, what they'd been told. And it was funny, he said that I can speak to the wallabies and they, they don't listen. They, they're not going to listen. And here he is, the captain <laughs> and the best player. And no one was listening to what his dietary advice was. Yeah. Which is is echoed, I think, amongst that community, isn't it? But it's interesting that you cut, you know, you mentioned that it comes from the brain because um, the brain um, uses glucose, doesn't it? Obviously, we can create X amount of glucose, but glucose will pass into the brain through the GLUT1 transporter. And most of the cells are used by the GLUT3, but the hippocampus also uses GLUT4. Now, the GLUT4 transporter is insulin dependent, which means that it requires insulin. So, in the state of of insulin resistance, i.e. an athlete who has been consuming lots and lots of carbohydrate for, for a very long time, they can their brain can literally be swimming in a sea of, of glucose, but unable to uptake that glucose, which is one of the, the negative effects, isn't it, of, of this, uh, of insulin resistance. Um, but the amount that we need there, the body is, is able to create, you would say, from the liver when we are keto adapted and i think that's where um a lot of louise burke's studies fall down because one of them in particular uh, i know that she only allowed three weeks for that adaptation process and it can take anywhere in my experience between six at least 12 weeks between between three months and 12 months um, and i've even seen people begin to adapt deeper and benefit uh, a lot more beyond 12 months but I think in, in the main study that, that she published, um, it was three weeks of living a keto lifestyle on uh, inadequate protein and lack of electrolytes. Um, and the issue is when we become ketogenic, um, insulin drops almost overnight. This signals the kidneys to release sodium from the, pot, uh, from the body from four points in the nephrons in the kidneys. And now we're left with uh, a sodium deficiency, which is imperative for athletic performance as well as health and well-being. So it does seem that a lot of these studies that are being pushed within that community um, are heavily biased and not looking at the full picture, which baffles me because I'm a person who is in pursuit of optimal health and well-being. And if you were to tell me that doing something would positively impact my life, my well-being and my athletic performance despite um, any pre, uh, you know, uh, conceived conceptions of what I believe to be optimal nutrition. I would, I would test that, that theory, but this community seems to be so hell bent against fat adaptation. And I think it comes down to addiction. I think I was about it, to say, it. yeah, it, food. So I recently did a podcast with Dr. Jen Unwin. Um, who yes, I know you're familiar of course. With. So, Very um, well. No, great the, the, friend of mine. 
Jen is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, we did a podcast on food addiction. Now, food addiction is something that is not recognized in the UK. It's not. So we've got drug addiction, alcohol addiction, gambling addiction, but food addiction is not recognized. It's one of the best podcasts that I've ever recorded. And it's the one with one of the lowest amount of views. And it's a shame because this breaks it down so perfectly. And once you understand what food addiction is, then you can combat that. And it's to do with the neurotransmitters in the brain, the catecholaminergic neurotransmitters, and how the body creates things like epinephrine, dopamine, no epinephrine, all of these things which involve these cofactors like zinc, iron, vitamin B12. Um, and these are things that are devoid in a high carbohydrate lifestyle. So even if we are consuming things that consume that contain these substances, things like lectins and phytic acid, which are rampant within the grains, are blocking the absorption of zinc, iron, magnesium, and vitamin B12, and things that are responsible for creating these neurotransmitters. And when we are unable to create these neurotransmitters, we look for the dopamine fix. We're hardwired to chase these dopamine fixes. And what gives us that fix? Well, it's that sugary treat or that carbohydrate food. And that's what we go for. And that's in there lies the issue, I think, with food addiction. And once we understand that, and we can take a step back and, and look at these grains that all of these athletes, these this bread, pasta, rice, the cereals that people are putting in, it's not just leading to a state of, of insulin resistance. It's leading yeah. to damage or the inability to create the neurotransmitters through the catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis is leading to this addiction and it's a vicious circle. And on top of that, this phytic acid and the, le the lectins will bind to insulin receptors. They'll signal the body to store five times more fat than insulin does itself, which is absolutely counterintuitive to athletic performance. Um, it blocks leptin, satiety signaling, uh, and the phytic acid, again, blocking the, the absorption of zinc, iron, magnesium, which is essential for the production of testosterone in both men and women. Uh, and it's essential for the body's ability to create energy. So it's it's absolutely counterintuitive. Um, but it baffles me why people are not listening to the information and coming away from these grains in particular and the seed oils, the seed oils, which are high in an oxidized omega-6 called linoleic acid, which is damaging the liver, leading to further insulin resistance and exacerbating all of these, these other issues. Um, but yeah, that, that was a fantastic podcast that I did, but it is, it's sugar addiction, isn't it? Yeah. Um, have you got any thoughts? I, I can see you're itching to jump in on there. So I'll, I'll leave you crack on. <laughs> Yeah, about a, a month ago, there was a tweet, there was a picture of a very good cyclist, and he, I didn't recognize him because that, the the story was this guy's just had the most famous, and it's not the guys leading the Tour de France side because I know them, but this guy I didn't know who he was, but he apparently he's having a, an incredible run of success, and he's thirty one years old, and here he is in the bus eating food, recovering obviously from the race, and there's a box of Oreos next to him. And he's got a, a drink, which is clearly a high carbohydrate drink. And then someone writes, this is the food of champions. I said, no, no, this is the food of sugar addicts. Spot and on. that didn't go down well. Yeah. yeah. And that, I quite agree with you. The reason, and I'm sure Jen will agree, the reason why people won't change is because they're petrified of getting rid of the, the sugar addiction. And I wonder to what extent the sugar addiction keeps the, the cyclists going. You, you know, you might... Maybe it's breaking them down, but it also might be giving them a lift. And that was another point in that the the race walkers talk. Race walkers in the trials, the guys on the high carb diet got sugar during the walk, but the guys on the high fat diet didn't. But Luis knows well that carbohydrates in the mouth influence performance. So that wasn't balanced either. That wasn't randomized controlled either. That's right, because you don't have to ingest the sugar or carbohydrate to elicit that response. Just simply tasting the the sugar mm -hmm. or carbohydrate can give you that lift in performance, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's right. Would you like to talk a little bit more about that? Because that, that's incredibly interesting as well. So it's not it's a case of not having to even ingest that carbohydrate. Just the body even think is 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 that the effect of a drug? Do you think 
is what you know could oh, we yes, yes. yeah i think i think high carbohydrates during exercise are probably acting as a drug and the reason i suspect that is because i've now i'm the first person to go through every single study of carbohydrates and exercise and going right back to the 1900s and i've tabulated every study and with the main findings and the main biological outcomes so you can go through all these studies, and I think there's something like 400 studies which have tabulated wow. the report, the results, and there are some you can't explain. So that, in other words, performance is enhanced, but there's no effect on blood glucose. In other words, most of them, if the control drops, you know that the carbohydrate's going to work. If the control group become hypoglycemic, you know, without a doubt, that the control that the intervention group will benefit, and that's that's standard. But there are some in whom the glucose stays constant for example they cycle 10 or 20 or even 100 k's but they maintain their blood glucose and yet the the ingested carbohydrate still has an effect yeah so it's not acting through hypoglycemia it's got another effect and to me that's probably a drug effect that that explains that yeah do you think caffeine could elicit that same response instead of oh, carbohydrate yeah. caffeine caffeine is definitely a quite useful for improving performance. And I'm just reading, there's a, there's a new study, anything that stops pain, if you've got a pain blocker, your performance will go up. There are all these interventions. I'm sure they're already being used by cyclists and others. Because the key is if you wanted to increase your performance, you'd get a pain blocker that you couldn't detect. And I'm sure sooner or later that that will be that will be used. So could that be the reason that a lot of the cyclists in the Tour de France are using exogenous ketones because of its ability to block NLRP3 inflammasone and reduce inflammation? Yeah, and I, and I think that's very important for recovery. Uh, absolutely. And then, so, and there was one other point that I needed to make was that in our study of the the mild repetition, the mild competition, we also studied, we gave these guys continuous glucose monitors and of the 10 athletes three that's 30 percent develop pre would pre-diabetic on the high carbohydrate diet on the high fat diet absolutely normal so that's the and they didn't change weight they didn't change their diet other than the calories in they didn't change the exercise and so that tells us that that it's just the carbohydrates i agree the omega sixes may also be acting because we changed the diet we've got rid of all that other stuff but it's that it's the high carbohydrate diet, the junk foods that are causing the diabetes. Yeah, for sure. Professor Knox, I'm just conscious of the time. I had so many other things that I wanted to go through, but look, I've taken up way too much of your time um, as it is. So I'll we'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, and I'll arrange another one with you sometime in the future to go through the other bits that I wanted to chat about, if that's okay with you. But would you like to tell everyone who's listening uh, a little bit about the Knox Foundation and where uh, the listeners can find you and more information about everything that you're doing within the community? Yeah, I think that if you go to our website, the Knox Foundation, we've just upgraded it and I'm really proud of it. So uh, you'll get all the information because we do a lot of things. It's not just carbohydrates and exercise or carbohydrates and health. Uh, we try to promote a high carbohydrate, uh, sorry, a high fat diet, healthy diet in the poorest communities in South Africa, because that's it's the poorest people who get the worst diets and have the biggest diabetes uh, incidences. And no one will address it. The governments don't address it. They just expect these people to die from their disease. And the pan the real pandemic is not COVID, it's type 2 diabetes. And just to finish up my dad died of type 2 diabetes and i watched him die being this strong powerful wonderful man he was reduced to almost nothing and once you've seen that you realize that my responsibility through that and that's one of the reasons why i'm so po positive about this the high fat diet because we can stop that happening and we can allow people as you your example you're one of the great examples i might add of what happens when you change your diet and you start eating proper food. I mean, your your story is just, it's its unbelievable. It's, it's unbelievable. Appreciate that. So thank you for what you've done. No, thank you. It uh, Look, you've been um, a major influence on, on my life as well as uh, I'm sure many of the other um, listeners and, um, you know, th th that are listening and watching this. 
Um, so thank you and thank you for everything that you do. But I'll I'll pop all of these links below. Um yeah. and we'll arrange to get you on sometime again in the future. So thanks again. I can't wait. Thanks, Rich, and thanks for everything you do. And you're just amazing. So so thanks so much. It's been a great privilege to be with you today.